Uh, just to close that subject, I have a, a colleague of mine who's in England, and he has a very strong theory about what's happening there. Um, claims to have compelling evidence that, hey, this is kind of an oil industry thing where they're buying up all these charging stations and hoping that everybody has a really bad experience for the next few years. So, uh, you know, conspiracy theories aside, wh what's your thoughts on reliability and, and what that adds uh, to as, as part of the value proposition, proposition to the customer? What do you think? Yeah. So, well, first of all, I, I you know, I, I love a good conspiracy theory like the next guy, but <laughs> I don't believe that that's happening. Is it, the oil industry is working against the proliferation of electric vehicles in a lot of ways, but I don't think it, they're doing anything with the hardware because the, the the hardware from other companies that have nothing to do with the oil industry is just as unreliable. It's not like the units that the oil companies you know, shell recharge network and, you know, the, 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 the ones that the, that the oil companies are running that they don't work, but everything else works great. Nothing works out there anymore <laughs> except the Tesla network. So, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I just think it's a matter of, as far as reliability, Tom, that this is all new equipment. This is, a, this is a new industry. You know, I've talked to Electro America at this in great length and, you know, they basically had to invent the 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 chargers that was all first gen stuff um and and you know they they almost kind of expected it not to work that great now now we're on the second generation stuff it's still not working well so um something's going on there but um i don't think it's a, a conspiracy um and but as far as valuated yeah and and now that that tesla supercharger network is going to open up to other manufacturers you know even the the legacy cars with ccs you'll be able to use it with an adapter um that's that's going to put a lot of pressure on all the other networks on EV Go, on ChargePoint, on Flow, on on Electrify America here in the U.S. at least to 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 improve their their reliability. If they don't, the people just won't go there, and and they'll 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 just all look for Tesla supercharger networks. Tesla will continue proliferating their uh th their network. And um, they'll be an extraordinarily dominant force, even more so than they are now. Um, and that might happen uh, because I don't see signs of the other networks improving their reliability at all. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. And so you mentioned the supercharger network. Um, uh, just a little backgrounder on why I asked this next question. Um, there's the transition from our four or 500 volt infrastructure to what needs to be an 800 volt system. Um, and the few cars that have 800 volts that are out there, I always have some sort of provisional way to DC fast charge at 800 volts from a 400 volt system. So, you know, everything from a dedicated box like in a Lucid or a Porsche all the way to, you know, integrating it into the motor and inverter on an Ionic 5. Um, you know, these are all unique ways. We took apart a Hummer, and the Hummer reorganizes its 400-volt battery into an 800-volt battery for mm -hmm. direct DC fast charging. Um, we now heard what Tesla's done, and I was looking at their fancy um, double-pull, double-throw switch, and oh, wow, is that an eloquent alternative to what we tore apart and found inside the, the Hummer. And I thought the Hummer thing was just spot on beautiful until I saw this new one. So very cool stuff. But my, my point is that now they've opened up their infrastructure for other car companies to utilize. Um, they have a kind of a problem that a lot of people don't like to talk about, but that is that they don't have their 800 volt system together yet. They have to deploy it and it's slowly rolling out. Um, so, you know, even, um, this notion of, um, having boxes to do the adaptation or reorganizing the battery packs on the fly. My point is this was a brilliant move on Tesla's part because now they have a way of generating revenue that will help them fund what will be this next generation infrastructure, at which point, yeah, they're going to be 10 years ahead again. So my point of that is they keep doing these things that keep them positioned very well ahead of the competition. And I think that's 
you know, one of their ploys. So what do you th think about that? You know, it's brilliant from the perspective you just described where now all the other providers have got to step up their game all the way to, um, you know, now everyone's got a more friendly experience with this by being able to experience the supercharger network and its inherent improved liability. Your thoughts on that would be greatly appreciated. And I planted a bunch of seeds, pick any one of them and grow it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, as far as the 400 volt, 800 volt um, issues, they'll work it out. Uh, you know, I, I don't have any doubt that that Tesla has a grand master plan uh, on that. And uh, will it take years? Yeah, it'll take years. We're not gonna, you know, um, uh, you know, by the end of 2024, you know, have uh, all the solutions. You know, you have companies that like Lucid for a while. They they they're very hesitant to commit to NACs because you know they 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 want to they don't think it'll be a good charging experience with the current hardware that Tesla has out there uh, for their customers. Um, but I, I, I think Tesla understands that the industry, a good portion of the industry is going to transition to 800 volt. I, I think even down the road, not all vehicles will be 800 volt, but we'll, we'll, we'll see, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, so as you, as you mentioned, how Tesla just seems to manage to stay a step ahead of everyone or, or 10 steps ahead of everyone. They, they, they knew this was going to be an issue. I'm sure they're, they're working on solutions and, um, it's going to mean, you know, a lot of investment and upgrading infrastructure that they already have in the ground. Um, and uh, I, I don't doubt that they'll do it. I just think it's going to take some time to, to get all that worked out. And, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're still, you know, we're still years away from having a stable coast to coast, you know, charging network in the country that's reliable and easy to use, you know, that. I don't think we're going to have that till the early 2030s. So, you know, we, 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 it's going to, it's going to take a while and, and it's a good thing uh, that adoption isn't going to happen overnight that, you know, next year, we're not going to sell 20 million EVs because we, we wouldn't be able to handle it with the infrastructure we have. We have to solve these issues and improve infrastructure. Um, I do think that, you know, even though you've seen a lot of doom and gloom forecasts with EVs in the news lately, um, I do think we're kind of at the beginning of that hockey stick adoption rate, you know, where it's kind of it's been going and now we're right here and it's really going to take off over the next three or four years. Um, uh, and towards the end of this decade, for sure, the majority of personal transportation vehicles sold are going to be uh, fully electric. I, I, they certainly all won't be by the end of this decade, but the ma majority will be. And hopefully the infrastructure will have improved greatly over the next five or six years. Now, I know we're in a terrible place with infrastructure right now, you know, and, and there's so many questions. You brought up a really good one with Tesla's network and 400 volt, 800 volt with the reliability issues of Electrify America and EVgo and ChargePoint and all that stuff. But as, as you mentioned earlier, you know, I've been driving EVs since 2009. And you think about it, I installed the first public charging station in the entire state of New Jersey in 2009. And, and you know, that's only 14 years ago. And look at where we're at, you know, in those 14 years. And I know everybody looks at it and says, oh my God, infrastructure sucks and we're way behind. We need to have more. And I agree that we do. Of course we do. But we've come an enormous, the, the first four or five years I drove EVs, there was no movement on infrastructure. It really started happening around 2015-ish, somewhere around there. So in 10 years, look at how far we've come. Yes. So uh, I'm very, I'm very hopeful. I'm very uh, uh, bullish on the fact that over the course of the next seven or eight years, we're going to have a dramatic improvement in, in public infrastructure. All right. So so what do you think about other value propositions for the, the charging companies? Uh, solar panels, is that a gimmick or can that actually contribute? I know you have your own solar installation for home. Um, you know, is that going to become a more popular thing? We're going to see solar canopies? I think so. Uh, you know, I, I, I think, um, uh, and th there's a few companies out there uh, doing them right now, uh, but there's obviously problems with that because, you know, you just don't have enough surface in most instances to produce really enough electricity. Uh, I think it will help. I think um, it, many installations are going to have uh, solar canopies, are going to have on site energy storage. And I think the combination of the two is going to help, you know, reduce that um that peak demand that um you know seems to cause a lot of problems with the grid when uh you know when everybody's trying to charge at rush hour during the day and 
Um, uh, you know, there's, there's a, a, a the peak demand seems to happen while there's daylight hours. So if the sun is shining, at least the solar could be contributing. The batteries uh, on site can help shave that off. Um, I, I think we're going to see a lot of that. Um, but, you know, I, I also think we're going to have more intelligent uh charging stations in the future let's say you know where everybody now plugs in and immediately wants the most amount of power they can have um there might be uh, s stations where you, you pay a little bit more if you get the full power in your car like during peak hours and maybe if you're not in a rush you can you can pay half the price if you go inside and have a cup of coffee and take you know 60 kilowatts instead of you know that 200 kilowatts if you really only need uh, you know, 20 or 30 kilowatt hour to get to your destination. You don't have to plug in and immediately start pulling 200 kilowatts. I think we're going to see, let's say, charging uh, stations, platforms where there's uh, coffee shops and things like that and 30, 40, 50 chargers. And there might be uh, different pay rates depending on how much power you want it at any one given time if you're not in a rush. I think we're going to see a lot of solutions to, to these problems, Tom. I, I, I think a lot of the solutions are things that aren't even on our radar right now, but, but, you know, industry is smart and, and they'll come up with solutions and we'll figure this out. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that place where um, it might seem impossible right now because the state of infrastructure, DC fast charge infrastructure in particular is, is pretty poor here in the U S.